Welcome to our 29th annual Harvest Breakfast. My name is Jenny Rhodes. I'm the County Ag Agent here in Queen Anne's County. I work for the University of Maryland Extension. On behalf of all the staff of Queen Anne's County Extension Office, we are certainly happy to see, see you this morning. On your way here this morning, you have, may have seen several fields with still st standing crops. So our farmers are still working hard to get the crops um, out of the field. So still some more soybeans. What? Or stuck combines, that's true. We could, yeah. We've had lots of uh, combines stuck in the mud and other things. So um, usually I give you a, a recap of what, ha what has happened in the ag world, but the only thing I'm going to say this year is rain, rain, and more rain. Um, it's been a very trying year for um, farmers, and I think, uh, but, you know, as usual, we're optimistic. We get through it, and, and certainly uh, we move on. But, you know, really in the realm of things, we are very blessed. We are not like the Carolinas or, or down south. Things can, can always certainly uh, be worse. So we have lots of guests here this morning, so you know my usual realm of how I do it. So anybody that, um, from the Chamber of Commerce, please stand. We'll give them a round of applause. Thank you all for coming. You might stay in several times. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions this morning. How about any farmers? How about our farmers stand up? Uh, how about, I think I saw one county commissioner. We got any other county commissioners? Jack's here. So thank you, Jack. Thank you for all you do. Uh, how about anybody that works for county government? There's, come on, there's a few, I know. That's right. How about state government? I know we have Steve Collins here from MDA and Hans, and yes. We have representation from the governor's office, so I mean, we've just got all the big wigs here today. We're so excited. How about the federal government? I know um, Jim, my courses work. Stand up, Nancy, and our CSFSA. Mike, thank you. How about our, our master gardeners? That's a certainly important uh, group of people that help us uh, an extension. And how about any nonprofits? Anybody here from any nonprofits? Sometimes we have a few. Oh, we, we do? Oh, we got, yeah, see? Lots of nonprofits, so. And how about if you're a 4-H'er or you were a 4-H'er? Stand up. Yay. Pretty, impress pretty impressive group. Uh, how about FFA members? I don't want to forget them also. How about if you were an FFA member, stand up. Come on, keep standing, keep standing. Okay, so. So if I, I hope I got everybody now. Everybody should have stood up sometime or other. I didn't say state government? Oh. I said state government? Okay. If I, if I didn't say state government, if you work for state government, stand up. <laughs> okay, they don't want to know who they are. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's uh, get started. I'm going to ask uh, Miss Bailey Riggs. So we are very excited. Miss Bailey Riggs is not only Miss Queen Anne's County Agriculture, but she is also Miss Maryland Agriculture. That is a really big deal. So we are very she, I can't tell you what a great job she is doing representing uh, Maryland and agriculture. So we're going to ask her to give the invocation. Please bow your heads and pray. Loving God, bless us all as we gather here this morning in friendship and appreciation. We thank you for those who you entrust with stewardship of your creation and for those who serve us in the United States military. Please provide us with wisdom and bountiful harvest for many years to come. Bless this food we are about to share, those who grew it, and those who prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Very nice. All right. We'll go ahead and have our pledges. I'm going to ask Peter Honor, the president of FFA, to come up and give the Pledge of Allegiance. And then I'll ask Will Gerald to follow him with the pledge, uh, the 4-H pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Will, Gerald is going to do the 4-H pledge for us. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, my health to better living, for my club, my community, my country, my world. All right, so now the best part of the whole program is our breakfast. So first off, let's give a round of applause for that wonderful breakfast. Um, I don't know if you can get the guys in the kitchen to come out. So I know that everybody really likes our Eastern Shore farmers breakfast, scrapple and sausage and all those good things. So thank you to all the volunteers. Those are all volunteers that, that do that. And I didn't uh, recognize Eva Stoops. Eva is our chair of uh, the chamber. So Eva, thank you very much for all you do. We appreciate it. We have a couple people at the front table. You'll get to meet um, some of them, but uh, Malin Rhodes is here. She is our vice president of FFA. Let me see. I think you'll meet everybody else. Darren Jarbo is here. Jar Darren is my ag program leader. He's my boss, so only say good things about me today. <laughs> he's, he's pretty new. Um, how long have you been here? Six? Nine oh, nine months. Oh, I say in six months. He's not new anymore? Okay. So we're, we're just happy that he's here and that he can come out and see some of the programs and the things that we do. And then you'll meet the rest of them a little bit later. Sure. <laughs> That's right. So our, um, you know, we always, our job is to educate people on agriculture and things that are going on. So this year we decided that we would talk for extension, like you don't hear me talk enough, but maybe you might hear, want to hear me talk some more. So our team um, at the Extension office got together and we decided that we were going to talk about how Extension works for you. So we feel like there's probably lots of things that we do that people really maybe don't understand. So of course, as anything, we have to start with the history. So how did, how, how did Extension really start? So it really started with the Morrell Act in 1862 and that's when Congress gave several states land and their job was to establish a colleges and in these colleges they were to emphasize agriculture and mechanical arts and then in 1887 came the Hatch Act and that is when the establishment of the research stations and we have some people here today from our research station right down here at the Y so he's I know John's here John Tommy who else Joe wave so we have people here. So we're pretty lucky in our county to have the Y Research and Education uh, Center, but we have actually four through the state. And then the second Morale Act in 1890, that was the establishment of really the historical black colleges. So in Maryland, that's University of Maryland, Eastern Shore down to Princess Anne. And then in Delaware, pr pretty close to us is Dover, uh, Delaware State. And then uh, along comes the Smith-Lever Act. So when the Smith-Lever Act um, was enacted, this is really the start of the National Cooperative Extension Service. And our job was to extend outreach programs through land-grant universities to educate rural Americans about advances in agriculture's agricultural practices and technology. And really, you know, through 100 plus years, that's still what we do. Now, so there are some things that have changed, but I actually found this uh, picture when I Googled, and it's a picture that was hap happened in Maryland. So we'll have to figure out maybe where that picture might have, have come from. So today, the land grant um, system, there's over 100 land grants um, throughout. And of course, ours, our original land grant is College Park. And I put together this, well, I should say Rachel put together this uh, flow chart to really show how, so from the University of Maryland goes down, there's lots of colleges, I'm not sure exactly how many colleges there are at the University of Maryland, but we're the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and from there, Extension is under that. So today, Extension is in every single county and in Baltimore City, so we are the outreach, we are the arm of the University of Maryland. And of course, we have our research um, centers, and we have several program areas that you're going to hear about today, agriculture, of course, and food systems, 4-H youth development, environment, 
and natural resources and healthy living. And everything that we do are all open to the public. And we have to have an affirmative action statement, you can see on the bottom there, that just says that we're open the door to everybody. So we have some guiding principles with Extension, I think that are really important and help us when we're thinking about our programs and things that we have to do. So we have to figure out how to reach people. They're all, always not gonna walk in our door. Um, we have to figure out what their interests are, we have to understand what their needs are, and then their ability to come to programs or how we can actually communicate with them. We have to figure out how we're going to engage them. You know, traditionally, you know, programs, people come to something like this or Agronomy Day or other things. But we're finding out there's lots of new ways that we can, we can educate people. And then our real goal is to help them to help themselves. So I'm going to start. So I already introduced myself. You kind of know who I am. I'm the County Ag Agent or the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources. That's really my um, official title and I have to say that I love my job and I love certainly all the things that I do but we always want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the farmers we did a needs assessment several years ago and we asked the farmers what are the things that you want us to do well number one they, they told us they want us to teach others what agriculture is second they want us to help farmers with, with regulations we know we're all in business there's lots of regulations out there and third, they want us really to be the traditional county ag agent, hands-on help. I really think that we can do this through um, communication. And I'll never forget when I started my job, the first day my ag program leader came in that day and said, Jenny, you gotta have a vehicle of communication. Mm -hmm. So when I think about all the vehicles of communication I have today, between a monthly newsletter that goes out by email or the post office, phone conversation, one-on-one, -on -one, Social media, anybody who knows me knows that I like social media and I think that it's an important way that we will, you know, really influence and try to teach people the things that we do. Emails, we talk to reporters, we put on seminars, we write papers, we write journal articles, we write fact sheets, um, host meetings, and I spend a lot of time going to meetings. And my family says, my gosh, you're going to another meeting. But my job is really to, represent agriculture and I have to be the voice in the room for agriculture because I can tell you a lot of people just have no idea of the things that we do. So in our programs we have a lot of annual programs that we do. Agronomy Day we hold here right here at the 4-H Park. We have about 250 people that attend uh, each year. Through our programs we have to show economic impact so we ask farmers questions. How much money have we saved you? How have we increased profitability? So you can see, usually about every, every year, we have about 126,000 acres represented at Agronomy Day. So it's really fascinating that they tell us that we're increasing their profitability by $22.39 per acre, which really brings economic impact back to our region. Because I won't just say Queen Anne's County, but we have people from Delaware and, and all over that, that attend. Harvest Breakfast, here's another annual where we come together, we collaborate, we can't do our job without collaboration. We, we rely on each one of you to support us, whether it's monetarily or picking up the phone and say, hey, Jenny, I think you need to do this or do that. I think it's, it's just really important. And then giving back today, we're giving back uh, to the food bank, and we think that that is really important, because like I said, we are really blessed when it comes down to it. We put on field days. Uh, we work with, like I said, nonprofit uh, organizations. It's amazing. You know, you put on a field day and 40, 450 people show up and you're like, wow. So people do, they want to know what we're doing. They just, they don't want to come always to a program like this, but they want to come out to the farm. They want to see, they really want to see what's going on. I think it's really important that we show people uh, what we do. We started uh, two years ago. This will be our third Ag Awareness Day. We have 16 organizations that came together to educate about 600 plus um, seventh graders in the county. Um, our county commissioners worked with us. I mean, it's just a great list of people um, that came together. And when we teach kids about agriculture, we're not only teaching them, we're teaching their teachers and we're teaching their chaperones. And we're teaching them about careers. And that's why we selected the seventh graders, because we thought it's an important time for them to learn that it's not a career in agriculture, it's not just really about uh, being a farmer. And then we have a nutrient management program at our office, Casey is here. Where's Casey? Oh, she might be hiding somewhere. Casey is our nutrient management advisor. She writes nutrient management plans for farmers. So if a farmer has $2,500 in income 
or 8,000 pounds of animals, eight animal units on his farm, he has to have, he or she has to have a nutrient management plan. So it's really just a prescription approach. Our job is to take the soil samples, we match the nutrients in the soil to the, nu to the nutrient needs of the crop. And those nutrient needs come from the University of Maryland. Um, and they work on that, that research for that information. And then it also, we, of course, we test all the manure, and if you put in dairy manure, poultry manure, whatever might be going on the crop. So it's kind of a prescription approach. Casey plants about 25,000 acres annually. We have about 250 farmers that get an, um, a nutrient manager voucher. So you know in Maryland we have to have a license for everything. So you have to have a license for pesticide. You have to have a license to apply manure or commercial fertilizer. So we, my job is to help to get those farmers recertified or certified as things move along. We do a lot in women in ag, as you know. Um, I'm pretty passionate about women in agriculture. My mom was probably um, first one of those like five women that you know drove trucks to the mill and took all five of us you know in the truck and I think it's women have always been part of agriculture but probably just not at the forefront so Shannon Dill um, the county ag agent in Talbot County we do a lot of programs on women in ag we have an annual conference every year in Dover we have a six-week um, program we put together um, called Annie's project to help to educate engage and empower uh, women and then besides our annual meetings, we have a lot of discussion groups. We've learned that we're not supposed to call them meetings anymore, we call them discussion groups. So bring people together to discuss things. And we really do know that when people come together, oh, I'm almost out of time, I better talk faster. Uh, uh, when people come together, they do learn um, a lot. And so the more that we can converse and just not me stand up and teach or bring someone in to teach. Um, poultry discussion groups, grain marketing. So again, educating people about agriculture is very important. I love to take people to my farm, to other people's farms. If you want, if you have a farm and you like me to come and bring people, I'm always happy happy to do that. So whether it's national associations that we bring in, local kids, uh, Washington College students, international universities, a lot of different uh, things that we do. So in my closing, before I turn it over to the next, I did write a couple words that I wanted to say. I wanted to say that my work with the University of Maryland Extension is certainly very rewarding. You know, as world population grows and land-based dwindles, ag extension education will play a vital role in the increasing our food supply. You know, that I have an invested interest in my community in which I live, work, and play. I certainly plan to continue to educate anyone that wants to learn about agriculture, maybe some that, that don't, but my job really in the end is to help p farmers to be profitable and anybody that wants to start a new enterprise to be successful. So that's a little bit about what I do. Now I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Rose and she's going to talk to you a little bit about her program. I'm a little bit shorter than you. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Just a smidge. <laughs> Hello, everyone. As Jenny mentioned, my name is Rachel Rhodes. I'm the University of Maryland Extension Queen Anne's County Master Gardener Coordinator and Horticultural Educator. It's a kind of a mouthful. Um, so the Master Gardener program started in Maryland in 1978. Today we have 20 um, counties that have a Master Gardener program, including the city of Baltimore. The University of Maryland Master Gardener volunteers combine their love of plants, people, and the environment to help residents in their communities to make environmentally sound decisions while reinforcing the university's mission to provide non-biased research-based information to our communities. And that's really our goal through all of our programs is to make sure that we're not only meeting our own, our own program mission and goals, but also reinforcing that university mission. So just a little bit of history about the Master Gardener program. Um, we started in 1998 here in Queen Anne's County under the guise of then County Extension Director, Paul Gunther, if he's still here. Thank you, Paul. Um, the first class was made up of 25 interns from all over the shore. So we had interns from Queen Anne's, Kent, Dorchester, Talbot, Caroline, and if you think about Queen Anne's County, we were kind of like the mothership for 
Master Gardener programs on the Eastern Shore. In 2006, Talbot County was able to start a program followed by Dorchester County. We still hold most of our trainings together as a unit and collaborating with our fellow Master Gardener coordinators is really, you know, the heart of our program. Our volunteers over the past 20 years, we've trained over 1,800 people to be Master Gardeners on the Eastern Shore. And in Queen Anne's County exclusively, they volunteered over 65,000 hours, which equates to about $1.6 million in in-kind service back to Queen Anne's County. Today, we have 65 active master gardeners, 20 interns, and 16 emeritus master gardeners. Annually, this group volunteers about 3,200 hours back to Queen Anne's County. Um, each volunteer is required to do 40 hours of continuing or 40 hours of volunteer service in their first year as an intern. Following that, they have to do 20 hours of volunteer service followed by 10 hours of continuing education. And it can be in any horticultural topic. We usually have trainings for them throughout the state that they can get their continuing education hours in. So in Queen Anne's County, we have four signature programs. And I'm going to talk about each one of these specifically. But this is our brand new logo, and we love it. For all, we have different logos for each of our programs, and we, we absolutely love them. So our Baywise program, as most of you know, living within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, Maryland residents live within a half a mile of a storm drain, river, or a stream. And what we do in our landscapes can affect the health of our local waterways, the Chesapeake Bay, and our environment. Through the Baywise program, Master Gardeners have offer free landscape consultations, and if your landscape measures up, you're eligible to receive a free sign. And we have, oh, hey, look, a fast cap sign and a Baywise sign, look at that. That was our first farm um, certified under the Baywise program. And this program is open to all Queen Anne's County residents It's and, and business owners, and it's all over the state. So if you don't live in Queen Anne's County, you can certainly contact any of your Master Gardener programs and have your landscape evaluated. So this is another really great collaboration. As Jenny mentioned, we live and breathe through collaborations, and most of our programs wouldn't happen without that. In 2007, the Queen Anne's County Department of Public Works received a grant through the Maryland Department of Natural Resources to install a rain garden at the Centerville Library. And working with the University of Maryland Extension Master Gardeners, they were able to develop a plan for this rain garden. It actually mitigates about 13,000 square feet of impervious surface and can handle a two-year rainstorm, so about three and a half inches, which we've gotten plenty of those over the summer. It, can, it's about 20, it holds about 25,000 gallons of rainwater before it goes into the Corsica River. Um, so this rain garden has certainly changed over the years, um, and this is our installation picture and just how it's grown over the years. It's, it's huge, and, and if you ever go to the Centerville Library, it's a really good thing to see. Our master gardeners are in charge of maintaining that rain garden through the growing season, so you can see them out there every month on the third Thursday, making sure that it looks pristine. And we actually, and we still work with the Department of Public Works to make sure that it's mulched, the riverbed looks good, and that, you know, it's maintained properly. Our Grow It, Eat It program was la launched in 2009 as a result of a growing need for homeowners to learn about growing their own food. Um, we actually have four gardens within the county and in Kent County. Um, the Galilee Community Garden is right in Chester. If you are looking to have a have a raised bed and grow your own vegetables, that's a really good one on, on Kent Island. The Southersville Elementary School Garden is actually a partnership through our FESNI program, we like acronyms here, and, and the Judy Center. And we work with um, pre-K and kindergarten kids and teach them how to grow their own food. Um, Washington College Campus Garden and the Kent County Middle School Garden. Our Ask a Master Gardener Plant Clinic 
is huge for Queen Anne's County. We focus on outreach education about plant and pest questions. Residents can bring samples or photos for ID. Um, and we are at the Ken Island Farmers Market the second Tuesday of every month from January to December. And then we're at the Chestertown Farmers Market from May to September every other weekend. And that's a really, really big outreach avenue for us. And not only do people bring in plant samples, but they actually come back week after week and then they bring things into the office for us to ID as well. Our pollinator program is to educate, it's to educate homeowners about pollinators and natural enemies. We have three initiatives with this program. We need, we would like to promote environments that support pollinators, promote natural enemies as an alternative, and to increase awareness about poll pollinators and natural enemies. And for each of these programs, our pollinator program, our Go and Eat It program, our Ask a Master Gardener program, and our Baywise program, we do classes throughout the county, and they're usually always free and open to the public, as Jenny mentioned. So rounding out the Master Gardener program, we try to be engaged in community events as much as possible, from attending the Chestertown Tea Party, to Centerville Days, to our week-long booth at the Queen Anne's County 4-H Fair. We always like to be involved, and we always like to have our Master Gardeners out in the face of the community. And if you would like more information, we have a Facebook page too, and we also have newsletters and our county website. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Chris Johnston. She's our 4-H educator. Oh. Oh, did I go over time? Well, they wanted me to tell you all about 4-H in five minutes. So here we go. Can you listen quick? Um, this picture is representative of when 4-H started in Maryland back in 1914. Have any of you ever tried to teach an old dog new tricks? Well, um, I have an 86-year-old mother-in-law that still cans everything with a water bath canner, including venison. And uh, Jenny and I, we teach um, canning classes. And when I tried to nicely say to her years ago that, you know, that's dangerous. Have you ever heard of botulism? I haven't killed anybody yet, so I'm doing what I do. So that's what was happening to the uh, Green Acres. Was it Mr. Haney Ag Agents? They were going out and trying to talk to the experienced farmers and homemakers. Uh, we had home demonstration agents. And they were like, you know, get off of my property. I've been doing this. And, so they decided what we need to do is we need to work with the next generation. So when little Johnny's corn yield and little Susie's baking and cooking products were much, much better than dad's, guess who welcomed the ag agent into their kitchen the next year? So that's how 4-H was started. Uh-oh, which button? There, okay. And our mission was then, as it is now, we have a pretty long mission statement there. Uh, youth Development Program provides a supportive and inclusive setting for youth to reach their fullest potential in a diverse society. Youth learn social and cognitive skills throughout community-based, research-based education. And that's what we are, that's what we do, um, you're going to find out at the end of my program why that's important for you to know. Um, and I had someone say to me, well, you have to have a cow or you have to bake a pie or whatever to be in 4-H. No, that's not true. We have 160 different project areas. And that project is just the vehicle, the venue by which we teach these important life skills to make them productive citizens for tomorrow. And I actually had someone I highly respect say to me, well, you know, you had like 69 kids showing pigs at fair. Like, are they going to be, they think they're going to be professional herdsmen? No. The pig is their interest. That's the project that we get them engaged to do everything that we do in 4-H. Which, if you are pledged that will let us in, I pledge my head to clearer thinking 
my heart to greater loyalty, my health to better living, and my hands to larger service in my club, community, country, and world. Um, people in leadership and youth development have identified that these are the very skills that for people of the next generation to be productive leaders um, in the future, they need experience in all of those areas. And if you know, you see there the head, it's to get them to be, they want to learn about their pig, they want to learn about nutrition, they want to learn um, heart. They're compassionate, they care about others. I don't know how many of you visit um, Corsica Hills, but frequently our 4 H llamas are down there visiting the, the patients. Um, hands, they have the skills. I'm a faculty member of the college. I can't say that college is for everybody. Get yourself a saleable skill if college isn't for you. And that's what we teach in 4-H also. And health, we want them to have healthy living. In Queen Anne's County, we have 174 youth involved in what we call our traditional clubs. This is our 4-H park, the best 4-H park in the state. I will argue that with anybody. Um, right there, over in our rifle range, uh, we train Jenny the, um, Jen, I'm looking at Jenny Schmidt, she's a leader in that club. Marksmanship, the junior Olympic champion female was trained right there in our 4-H park. Um, Bridget King, Bridget, you're here. You are here. Stand up. Was just recognized in the nation as the most knowledgeable child in Livestock Skillathon. How we do this, there's me who I'm never here. Um, I'm everywhere um, because of my other assignments. There's Sally Rosenberry who is here. Sally, you here? Stand up. She might be in the kitchen. She's probably in the kitchen. And then Sue Wolf is our admin. Um, we only do this, just like Rachel said, we had these volunteers donated over 6,100 hours last year to work with our kids, which was almost 150,000. This is how we do it. As I said, I'm rushing through this. Every 4-H activity, these kids feel like they belong. They have an opportunity to try. We direct it with hands-on experiential learning. So we let the kid try. And if we know that's not going to work, as long as it's not unsafe, we let them try it. And then when it doesn't work, then we help them work through it. Public speaking next to death is a human's biggest fear. <laughs> Our 4-H'ers are required to do a speech and a record book every year. So these are what we talk about, our important skills. We're actually doing research right now where we have, um, I'm working with a junior faculty, looking at those 30-somethings that are now in the workforce and the ones that are getting promoted that are doing well in their jobs. Are, I see you shaking your head back there. Stand up. <laughs> Um, what's his name? Um, Ryan Snow. You're shaking your head. Exactly why you've been successful. Ryan was a very active Talbot 4-H'er. You have the skills to think on your feet, to speak on your feet, to make decisions, to keep records. 4-H'ers uh, four are four times more likely to give back to their communities, two times more likely to make healthier choices, two times more likely to participate in STEM activities. International trip there, we just had Quinn Williams from here, went to Tanzania on an international trip, brought them sewing machines, taught them how to sew so they could then, in their community, be able to provide for their families. We work with the military, we do the training for the military bases overseas uh, through Maryland 4-H. I do webinars at 5 a.m. because that's their normal time. But why I wanted you all to know this is that if you are hiring and you see a resume that says 4-H on there, now I've had some that say that, and oh, well, they don't know what they did in 4-H. No. If you have somebody you're looking at, they have 4-H, I can guarantee they'd be an excellent employee. And if they're not, come back and tell me, so I'll stop saying that in public. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for that, Chris. I probably wouldn't be up here today if it wasn't for 4-H. It's an amazing program. So because I do nutrition and physical activity, I want everyone to stand up and get a little stretch in. All right, I know you've been sitting for a while. We had a heavy breakfast. <laughs> I won't make you do anything else, I promise. <laughs> Just a little stretch, then you can go ahead and sit back down. <laughs> My name is Ashley McLaughlin. I'm the Food Supplement Nutrition Education Project Leader and Nutrition Educator here in Queen Anne's and in Caroline County. So I think we can all agree that farmers that produce our food and the consumers who eat it are equally dependent on each other, right? So that's why Family and Consumer Sciences was created. It's a very important part of the School of Agriculture. And what we do is we really empower families to um, help them make healthier choices and better financial decisions. So under the FCS umbrella is the Food Supplement Nutrition Education Program, or SNAP-Ed. So that's where I come in. SNAP-Ed is funded by the Farm Bill, and we do have a different name in every state, so this is our name in Maryland, but you can also call it FESNI, because as Rachel said, we love our acronyms and extension. <laughs> The goal of SNAP-Ed is to improve the likelihood that those eligible for SNAP will make healthier lifestyle and food choices to prevent obesity. Because as you can see up here, obesity costs us a lot of money. In Maryland alone, obesity-related chronic illnesses can cost us $3 billion. And every $1 spent on nutrition education can then save us $10 in long-term health care costs. So nutrition is very important. FESNI utilizes a multi-level approach um, to not only provide direct education, but to create policy systems and environmental changes in everywhere we teach. So we have five teaching initiatives, and I'll go through all of them. Our first is the Healthy School Communities Initiative. 43% of Maryland children are eligible for free and reduced meals. And the schools that I work in, more than half of them in those schools are receiving those free meals at breakfast and lunch. And some of them, that's the only meal they're getting all week. So I go into schools on a monthly basis and I provide nutrition lessons and fruit and vegetable tastings because it's such a crucial time when kids are young uh, to really instill those healthy habits in them. I also do teacher trainings to facilitate healthy habits and uh, healthy role models. I also do smarter lunchrooms programs where we make sure we're highlighting those healthy options on the school lunch line. And we even build school gardens with the help of the extension team. And I have to give a shout out to Rachel for helping me out with that. Our next initiative is Healthy Tots, Healthy Families. And this is where I work with early childhood development centers like Judy Centers and Early Head Start programs. And I make sure that these kids are exposed to fruits and vegetables at a young age. I also work with a lot of parents uh, to teach them cooking classes, to teach them how to feed their families healthy food on a budget. Everyone wants to know how to do that, right? <laughs> and we even have a texting program. This is called Text for Healthy Tots, where we nudge parents uh, to incorporate more physical activity or um, show them where to shop local um, every day. Our next initiative is Healthy Changes for Out-of-School Youth. This is where I primarily work with Parks and Recreation. This is a crucial program because a lot of kids don't have a place to go after school or during the summer months while their parents are out working. And this puts them in a positive and engaged environment. So we work with kids in after-school programs, and I also work with my collaborators to provide the parents with students in after-school programs with cooking classes and grocery store tours to, again, teach them how to eat healthy on a budget and feed their families. Next is our Securing Food Resources initiative. One in nine people in the state rely on hunger relief programs like the Maryland Food Bank. So I hope you all made your donations today. <laughs> so I work with food pantries uh, to make sure that we're promoting the produce that's being handed out. Um, so, I mean, if you don't know what to do with it, you're not gonna eat it, right? So I provide them with recipes and uh, tasting demonstrations and we really want to hide that produce so that those food pantries aren't left with all that fresh food that should be going to hungry families. Last but not least is our Farm to Family initiative. 
And this is where I partner with um, local farmers markets to encourage everyone to shop local. And we also highlight and advertise that you can use your SNAP benefits at farmers markets. A lot of people don't know they can do that. So I do cooking demonstrations and teach people how to break down, prepare, and even preserve their produce that's in season. And we have a really cool uh, program that ties in our farm to school initiative um, where we can actually pay farmers to come to the school and talk to the kids about what they do. So we're really tying together, you know, uh, where food comes from and why we should be shopping local. So if there's any farmers in here today interested in coming to the schools, please come find me after, I'll make it happen. Finally, these are some of our impacts uh, locally and across the state of Maryland. As you can see, um, nutrition education really does make an impact on a young child's life, and those impacts are long-lasting into adulthood. Every day I get to do something new in this job, but the message is always the same. Food matters. And with that, rounding out our nutrition education program and all of our extension programs, I'll hand it back to Jenny, who's going to introduce our next speaker. So you can see that we're all pretty passionate about the things that we do. So we've invited um, Jim Hansen to come. Jim is our Associate Director of the University of Maryland Extension. He's housed in College Park and gets to travel around the state and keep, keep us all straight. So Jim, thank you for being here this year. For all the other people with uh, gray hair in the audience, I want to say I was, if I wasn't at the first 29th, first uh, harvest uh, breakfast here with Paul, I was there pretty close afterwards. And so this has been a great tradition, and uh, so it's a pleasure to be back here today. The, um, so Jenny just asked me to give a, an overview for extension um, in five minutes. We got, if you guys don't know, we have those things flashing at us up here. <laughs> and so. Um, so essentially we have, within UME, which is the field faculty, we have 150 educators around the state. Um, however, you do or do not know, or you know some of them, but we have approximately 50 uh, campus specialists, uh, which I was before I became the associate director, I was a farm management specialist, uh, on campus, and their job is to work statewide. Uh, people you probably know well that are state specialists are um, Paul Geringer, uh, from the Ag Econ Department, Sarah Eberhardt from the University of Maryland Law School, uh, Nicole Cook uh, from UMES, they all do the Ag Law Program, which is, with the needs assessment, has been a huge success. It's meeting a need and has been very much appreciated, so that's a good partnership. Uh, we've got uh, plant science, Nicole Filarini, our, our new agronomist, and so she, while she's on campus and also centered at the Y, she works statewide. Uh, Gary Felton, you maybe know if you, <laughs> have learned to compost dead birds, then, you know, the, those are kind of, but we have people from these different, like seven departments, scat, you know, working, they're at College Park, but their job is to support the 150 educators and what they do. The, um, but let's just kind of go through the overall program because really, uh, I think extension, two things. One is it's more than you imagine, can imagine, and I mean that sincerely, and I'll make the final comment, and that'll explain that now, but at the end, I'll tell you why all extension is local. 4-H, um, so Chris did a nice discussion there statewide. Uh, we worked with 50,000 youth last year in, in Maryland, uh, of which 10,000 are in the clubs. And of course, the, the livestock uh, is um, always been a, a big leader, but increasingly with these kids, because of the school systems and the needs for children, we're working after school and in school, and we have environmental programs, we have STEM programs, and it's just, you know, the schools are begging us to come help them. The, um, so that's the first one. Second program we have out there is environmental natural resources. Uh, Rachel, within Master Gardeners is within that. And again, most of that, there's a lot of grow at eat it, as she said, and we're also working with Baywise and, and a lot of interest with the environment. But we also have watershed restoration specialists throughout the state, uh, very popular within these counties. They have to manage stormwater better, and we're working with them. We have oyster aquaculture. Uh, seafood safety, forestry, wildlife, and then the nutrient management program is, is, is uh, gathered under that, that program. And so these are a second major area. And um, finally, the third one would be family consumer science. Now, this is uh, 
the old home ec, but it, this really is now focusing on wellness for families uh, for all ages. And that has to do not only with nutrition and m managing diabetes and, and these kind of issues, but also financial wellness. This is important for people, you know, as we all know, it's just like managing your money, and that, that is directly related to nutrition. Under this is Ashley's program, FESNI, and um, they've worked with 35,000 people last year statewide. 93% of those are children. And this is, as she nicely described, this is a very important program. It's a lot of, uh, you know, focusing on exercise, focusing on how kids choose healthy foods, and it's been very, you know, they have documented, they do a lot of evaluation, documented success. Interesting statistic, which really leads to the importance of FESNI and 4-H working with these children on their, on their food issues is that there's a 90% correlation, BMI is your body mass index, which is a, a crude measure of your, your weight or obesity or non-obesity or whatever. 90, for a 10-year-old, it's 90% correlated with an adult BMI. So what you are as a 10-year-old, you're going to have to be fighting, you know, this is, and so this just comes back to making sure we're dealing with them. And finally, what we're all here today was agriculture. We have, uh, Jenny did a nice description of that. Darren is our new leader, that working statewide to provide leader, excellent leadership across the state. And again, for the agriculture, so maybe you guys think grains, soybeans, poultry, but we also work with forages, fruits and vegetables, commercial hort, uh, and milk. In fact, commercial hoard is the second largest ag industry in the, in the state. The, um, we work with all farmers. We have work with beginning farmers, small farmers, production farmers, women in ag. These are all different clientele. And so it's, you know, it's, it, it's really a much more complex uh, uh, grid. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, and then there's also, of course, the value added. We have organic, local foods, wine, hops. Flying Dog is a big partner of us now. So I guess you could say you're supporting the University of Maryland. <laughs> if you make your plan. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> and then, of course, we do production, farm management, marketing. And so uh, this is just a, a scope. And so, again, you all see this. And I said, I, I bring this back to you because I said all extension is local. This actually is a, is. Uh, um, comes from, if you will, Tip O'Neill, who was a former Speaker of the House, who said all po politics is local, which is true, and all extension is like local. And so what you all see in this room is this crowd. And as I've traveled around the state, what I have observed, if people like extension, they tell me, or they don't, sometimes not as much, and I'll say, what county are you from? And I said, aha, I understand. So this is a way of complimenting uh, Jenny and her colleagues that I hear nothing positive about Queen Anne's Kip. All oh, positive. Oh, oh. <laughs> so I, I wrote all positive. <laughs> I hear all positive about, nothing bad, all positive about Queen Anne's County. And you all to be, you're, you're fortunate to have such a great staff. So thank you. All right, now my face is a little red. I was a little worried there. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more things and we'll, we'll, we'll be done. Um, Paul Rickard, our Air Extension Director, has a few words that he would like to say. Paul, you wanna come up? Good morning, I hope you all have enjoyed your breakfast. Thank you to all you in the kitchen. It was fabulous, I thought. Did you all like it? All right, there you go. Show them the love. Well, I am your friendly neighborhood bean counter. Um, I am one of the directors, regional directors for Extension. Uh, currently, my territory runs from Queen Anne, which is the, the Queen Anne's, which is my furthest south, all the way up through Harford County. Uh, and I hit each office every week and check the paperwork and budgets and all of that. You may not realize, but we are funded federally at the state level and then at the local level as well. So there's a few pots of money that we have to make sure uh, is appropriate. And part and parcel to managing our local money is a group called the Extension Advisory Council. And we have uh, groups of local 
um, countyans who partake in that uh, as a leadership uh, and a volunteer um, uh, position. And what they do is they give us uh, three years or more of uh, their time helping us to make sure that we're appropriately uh, managing those funds and being fiscally responsible. And so uh, we have two people who are rotating off of that committee uh, this year. And so I would like to ask if Ms. Patricia Rhodes and Mr. David Clark, uh, I guess represented by his wife, June. Are you here, June, Ms. June? Ms. June's here. All right, if you would both come up, I would appreciate it. Um, I have a letter here and of, of thanks as well as a certificate of appreciation. Um, since Ms. Pat's here, I'll give it to you first. Um, Ms. Pat has been part of uh, Extension for quite a number of years as a 4-H uh, volunteer and group leader or club leader and also uh, most recently as a member of our Extension Advisory Council. And uh, she has contributed seven years, uh, at least, <laughs> uh, to our Adven Extension Advisory Council. And uh, as per our bylaws, she's got to rotate off, and then she can come back should she wish. <laughs> so thank you so much for your service. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And again, Miss June, I have a letter for your husband, Mr. Dave, as we affectionately call him in the Extension office. Uh, David Clark uh, has been on the Extension Advisory Council for 21 years, and so he has given a lot of his time and effort and energy, and uh, his smiling face is always a pleasure to see in the office, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that we recognized him for his years of service and helping us guide the Extension office uh, and the finances. So thank you very much. You. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, a couple more things and we can get back to work. Um, where's Scotty McGlashan? Scotty, stand up. Where is he? Scotty, understand today is your last day. So we want to say thank you for, how many years have you been clerk of the court? 24. 24. So we want to thank you certainly for your continued support of agriculture. So thank you very much. All right, Steve Schwab is here from the, and Amy Colley from the Maryland Food Bank. So if you want to come up, you want to say a few words, and then we'll tell you how much money we raised. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let Amy start. Okay. And we'll so, see how much time we have. I, I turn it down for you. Good. So I've got all morning. <laughs> Put it back up. <laughs> so I got here this morning. Steve said, by the way, I think I'll get you to speak today. So I have nothing planned. Everybody up here had index cards to speak from. So um, in watching the presentation, I just want to say how appreciative I am towards University of Maryland Extension here in Queen Anne's County. I started with the Maryland Food Bank as Farm to Food Bank coordinator eight summers ago. That's how I count my years is in summers. So eight summers ago, so one of the first things I did was ride around in my pickup truck and hit the extension offices. And I rode out to up here to Centerville to Jenny Rhodes and left some folders and asked if she would please uh, hand them out to any potential produce farmers and she did that. And uh, so that was one way I got into the door up here in Queen Anne's County. And then along the way, I've interacted with Ashley most recently uh, at different food events where we distribute food. She works together with the Maryland Food Bank. I've worked with the Master Gardeners. I've been to the Ken Island Farmers Markets. I've recruited volunteers that way. Queen Anne's County, by the way, has more volunteers than any other county in the state. So thank you, Queen Anne's County. <laughs> A number of those volunteers come to the 4-H program, so I've had a lot of 4-Hers out in the fields uh, gleaning produce with me. I've worked with the Y Research and Education Center with Mike Newell and anything they have. I've saw um, MDA, Steve Conley, and his group have been out gleaning apples. I see Jim Eichhorst here from USDA who brought a group. I think they picked the most bins of apples since we started right here on Kent Island, six bins that day, just this past fall. Um, I'm sure I'll forget some farmers. There's many up here that we partner with. Uh, Godfrey's Farm, Arnold Farms, Bob Arnold's here. He's the longest farm to food bank partner, one of two, uh, nine years standing. Uh, he started in 2010. So Bob, where's Bob? I know, 
Peter's here, and I met another son, Brian, but I don't see Bob. Anyhow, so Bob doesn't like a lot of attention. He's, he's 10 years standing with the Maryland Food Bank. Um, who else do we have? Allison, Howard, and Luke. I haven't seen them this morning. They've worked with us quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm so afraid I'm going to forget somebody. Jenny Schmidt has donated grapes in the past and maybe tomatoes in the past. I thank her for that. Her son uh, and Nicole picked sweet corn uh, from Galena last summer in a downpour. Uh, I think that was 11 bins of sweet corn. Is that right? Yeah, that was in, port, in downpours. They were soaked. Uh, who else have we worked with up here? Lowry's on Ken Island. We've gleaned sweet corn there. Um, and I'm sure I'm probably forgetting somebody, but I just want to thank everybody up here for your support and for opening your hearts this morning to the Maryland Food Bank. When you talk about children, that to me is the most heart-wrenching thing of it all. When you've got children in schools only eating breakfast and lunch and going home today, lunch may be their last meal until they go back to school on Monday. So whatever money you all donated, we triple that in value and are able to provide that much in meals. So thank you all very, very much. And Jenny, thank you for our invitation and I think four years for supporting the Maryland Food Bank at this event. It means a lot. <laughs> Extemporaneous. Hopefully that was okay. <laughs> and she didn't prepare anything. Imagine if, imagine if she prepares something. So again, I, you know, I had mentioned uh, Steve Schwab, uh, Director of Eastern Shore Relations at the Food Bank. And just real quick, a um, couple of tying into a few things that were said um, of those folks today that we have in Eastern Shore who are food insecure. We talked about a lot of them being kids. That's about 13,000 kids on the Eastern Shore. 42,000 of our friends and neighbors locally here on the Eastern Shore, the eight counties on the shore are food insecure. So they're not quite sure where one meal is coming from every day. So all that you've done over the past uh, four years that I've been a part of this has really been marvelous for us. You know, a couple of things we talked about today, I heard a collaboration, there's a lot of collaboration going on. Uh, Extension's role is education. You know, 4-H, and I learned a lot. I could come to these and I really learn a lot about that, especially being from the Northeast and growing up in an urban atmosphere. But you think about the head and you think about the heart and the hands and the health. And that's really what the food bank is doing right now. I want you to know that we've gone through a strategic plan. Our strategic plan starting in 19, 2019, is a lot more collaboration with other social service agencies. So while we're making progress, you know, last time I talked, it was 44,000 food insecure Eastern Shore people. Now it's 42,000. We're not making progress quick enough. And so um, uh, remember that the food bank is a safety net, not a hammock. And so our role is really to educate people as well. And we're going to be doing a lot more collaboration with groups like the Extension, with groups like the 4-H. Um, you guys are the experts, and uh, we also need to help teach folks how to do things rather than just giving them things. So I want you to know you, a, lot of, a lot of what you donated today is going to that. So we do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. This is pretty nice. Hey. Nice fat envelope. So this morning we raised fifteen hundred dollars. So thank you all very much. So that is for you to take thank home. you, Jenny. Thank you. Forty-five hundred meals. Forty-five hundred meals. So that's a lot of meals. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So I just want to say in closing, um, thank you uh, for coming this morning, and please have safe travels, safe, safe rest of your day, and please have a blessed holiday.